I'm internet sensation and teen heartthrob Jared Spool. <laughs> and yes, indeed, I did design the six keys above the inverted D arrow. Uh, it, someone was there. I mean, someone had to do it. It was like, you, you do it. I'm like, okay. I was there. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I actually want to talk about uh, is if we were to think of measuring user experience in terms of how much a company is willing to invest in user experience, the, the project that would probably just zoom past everybody else was a project put together by the Disney Corporation. It was this, the Disney Magic Band. And this project was basically a billion dollar investment on Disney's part. And what made it so sophisticated was what it could do. Right, so just getting these magic bands was was amazing, and and you you order them way in advance of going to uh, the theme parks. These things only work. This is a wearable that only works in three places on the planet: uh, Florida, California, and Shanghai. And you order them when you schedule your your visit, and uh, they show up a few weeks before you get there in this beautiful box with uh, Disney characters on it. Each band has been personalized and identified. And inside the band itself are, is a pack full of technology, including three different radio transmitters, a GPS, a uh, low energy Bluetooth, and NFC. And using this, it gives you all sorts of magical abilities, right? You can magically get into your hotel room by just putting the band up to the door. You can magically get VIP status on any of the rides that are at the park. You can magically just wave your arm and pay for things, even on purpose. <laughs> and... One of the most magical things about it, my favorite little thing, is that uh, if it's your kid's birthday, and this is a common scenario at Disney, that people go there on their kid's birthday, if it's your kid's birthday, the GPS unit will help their favorite character hunt them down in the park <laughs> and wish them a happy birthday, okay? It's a little creepy. But it's cool. If Uber has taught us anything, it's that creepy and cool can be simultaneously present <laughs> in a product. <laughs> the thing about the Magic Band that most astonishes me, more than anything else about the Magic Band, is that it came from Disney. And that's because in 1997, when we first started working with Disney's digital stuff, uh, one of the first things we worked with were the products of Disney Parks and Resorts, the same team that put out the Magic Band. And in 1997, this was their best work. <laughs> in addition to not being the most uh, aesthetically pleasing thing you've probably ever set eyes on. It, in fact, didn't work very well. It was highly unusable. In fact, it was so unusable that back in the 90s when we were, and 2000s, when we were basically spending our time training people how to conduct user research like usability tests, like we've talked about several times today, uh, uh, it turns out that, that if you want to train people on usability testing techniques, the best way to do it is to put something unusable in front of them and have them moderate a session. So we would actually use this website as our test uh, session, and, and, and it, it delivered great gifts. 
One of the tasks that I was particularly pleased with was, was a task that involved a, um, uh, a, uh, uh, a mother of a child who uh, the child loved trains and the mom loved Disney. And so she thought, how cool would it be if we brought the kid to uh, Disney and we stayed at one of the hotels that are on the little monorail system that runs around the parks. And that way, every morning, we could, uh, at, on our way to wherever we're going, we would have to take the train to be able to take it. And so she really wanted to know what the least expensive hotel that was on that monorail system was. So we turned that into one of our test tasks, and the task read, what is Walt Disney World's least expensive hotel that is on the monorail? Now, it turns out, if you know anything about Disney World, uh, there are three hotels that are on the monorail, the Contemporary Resort, the Grand Floridian, and the uh, Polynesian Resort. Of those three, two of them are wicked-ass expensive. And the last one is the Polynesian. And so that's the answer. That's all that our participants had to figure out, that they wanted to stay at the, at the Polynesian. And we would set them down in front of the machine, and we would ask them this question, and they would click away. And what was fascinating about it was that only one out of every 10 participants who we put in front of this would actually be able to complete this task. Nine out of 10 folks would fail. But what was even more fascinating to us was that of those nine out of 10, two out of that 10 would actually choose a hotel in Disneyland instead of Disney World. Now, for those of you not familiar with the Disney empire, there are many, many things that distinguish Disneyland from Disney World. Probably the most prominent of those things is that they are 5,000 kilometers apart. <laughs> now, this is okay. This is exactly the type of thing. This is one of the things that made this task so desirable to our training because what we need to do is we need to train people to have follow-up questions because one of the things you want to do in a usability test is you want to figure out, well, is it that they just prefer California to Florida or is it that they just don't understand which park they're in? Do they not know the difference between Disney World and Disneyland? I mean, these are important questions to get answered because the way we design the solution to it is going to be different depending on what the answer is. So, we would train the moderators to ask questions like, so from the hotel you picked, could you ride the monorail to Epcot Center? And the participant in the study would inevitably turn back to their machine and they would type away and click on things and, and then turn back to the moderator and they'd go, yes. Yes, you can. Now, Again, if you're not familiar with how Disney works, the monorail is a six-car train with no driver, no restrooms, and it moves at about 45 kilometers per hour. So that's a 5,000-kilometer journey you're going to go in with no bathroom. <laughs> so a few years later, i got to tell you this, a few years later, I'm... I'm uh, talking about this phenomena at a conference, and I am give the talk, and I'm packing up after the talk, and this person comes up to the stage, and she's wearing a badge that says, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. <laughs> and she says, can I tell you something? I'm like, sure. She says, you can't tell anyone. I'm like, okay. She says, you know that thing about people choosing the wrong hotel? Happens all the time. So I do some research and I come to find out that the parks and resorts team, they reserve a block of rooms <laughs> in case someone shows up at the wrong theme park 
with reservations for the other side of the country. <laughs> and this is how Disney thinks, right? Disney thinks that your vacation should not be ruined because of this mistake. So they actually are prepared. They have a, and, and you know, no, it gets better. When it is the most busiest time, when all the hotel rooms are sold out, they still keep that block. They could sell it for a ton of money. But Disney is so customer focused, so customer service oriented that, that they will keep that block of rooms just in case someone shows up with the wrong hotel. So now think about this. They keep a constant inventory of highly valuable, highly expensive hotel rooms because it is much easier to do that than to fix the fucking website. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where Disney was in 1997. And here we are in 2014, and Disney puts out a magic band, a piece of technology that is so advanced, so thoughtful, that it just blew away the entire market and the rest of the world's been sort of staring at it. And that billion dollar investment, that paid off in less than a year. Less than a year they made that money back. That's how intense this was. And they were able to do that. So this is the question. How does a team go from holding rooms because it's cheaper than fixing the website to actually investing a billion dollars and making it back in a year on the world's most expensive user experience project. That's the question that's most interesting to me. And to answer that question, we have to understand how people understand things. Um, to think about it, we, we want to sort of start with learning something, right? When any of us learns anything, you know, learning to cook, learning to play an instrument, making gyoza, uh, uh, any of these things, it, it turns out that we all start sort of in the same place, a place that's called unconscious incompetence. And unconscious incompetence means that we're not very good at doing this. Of course we're not. We just started. It makes sense that we're not good at doing this. There's no shame in that. But that's the incompetence part. We also don't know we're not very good at it. That's the unconscious part. Because we don't really know the difference between good and bad when it comes to this stuff, we're putting stuff together and we're making it, and it's a meal, and we serve it to somebody, or we pick up an instrument and we play some music. As far as we can tell, this is awesome. We couldn't do this before, we can do this now, this is amazing, right? And this is the stage of unconscious incompetence. And some people stay here very long and some people have friends. <laughs> and it's usually a friend who sort of tells you, please stop, don't do this anymore. And at that point, we progress to another stage. The next stage is that of Conscious incompetence. In conscious incompetence, we are now thinking in terms of uh, uh, the fact that we still aren't any good. We still can't cook anything. But now, because our friend told us about this, we know the difference between good and bad. And we know that the stuff we're producing is pretty bad. So in this stage, a lot of people give up. I mean, this is a very sad stage, right? To realize that all this stuff you thought was great suddenly is pretty bad. It's sad. The previous stage, very blissful, very happy. This stage, not so happy. So, we get to this stage, and most people give up. They just, right now, just like, I'm done. I, I can't do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I can't cook. I can't play an instrument. I'm, I'm not a good designer. They just give up. But some people persist. And those that the persist, they learn the basics, the way everybody else who learned to cook or learn a language or 
learn an instrument learn. They just learn the rudiments, the scales, they learn the basic lessons, they can play simple songs, they, and they, over time, they get good at it by just practicing and producing better and better outcomes each time. And that stage then transitions to becoming conscious competence. We're now able to produce good outcomes if we sit and think about it all the time. If we think about every note we play or every ingredient we put into the recipe, we can get good at it. And this can continue forever for people, but there are some people who one day just notice that suddenly they were able to make something or say something or play something without having the, the music in front of them or without having the recipe in front of them. And it worked. They just got enough experience, enough practice that they were able to produce good stuff. And at that point, they become unconsciously competent. Unconscious competence is when you can walk into the situation and you can figure out exactly what you want to do without having to have a pre-printed recipe to pull this off. So that's unconscious competence. And Disney, for sure, started at unconscious incompetence. They didn't know how bad they were. And when they shipped the Magic Band, they definitely were at conscious, unconscious competence. Now, we can think of this, these, this path as a series of journeys. The first journey is going from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence, and that's a journey of literacy. In this notion of literacy, we are learning the difference between good and bad. We're learning what makes a good meal, what makes a bad meal, and we're, we're just beginning to understand. When we transition from conscious incompetence to conscious competence, we are actually becoming fluent. You know, if we're talking about a language, we're learning the grammar, we're learning the words. We can listen to a sentence and actually parse it in our head and then reply in a language, in the same language, and it makes sense. And we're, we're, we're getting that notion of fluency. And going from conscious competence to unconscious competence, well, that's mastery. When we talk about mastering our craft, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about that last transition, that last journey from conscious competence where we're following the procedures to actually being able to improvise and get good results. To really explain Disney, though, this, the problem is that this is about individuals. This is about you and I and each person in the world. We really need to talk about an organization. And the path that an organization takes looks a little different. The path that an organization takes uh, is still a growth path, but it, it starts with, from a UX design perspective with the organization just having no clue that UX design is even a thing. We call that the dark ages. <laughs> and in the dark ages, UX designers uh, uh, don't exist in their world. Users don't exist in their world. They are so focused on just getting something shipped that technically works and meets whatever the business requirements are, that that's, that takes everything. That takes all of their energy. Now, what happens, and this happens more and more, is that an individual that they hire, often a fairly low-level individual gets hired, who knows somebody who is not or know something about users and UX. And they say, you know what? This thing that I'm working on, this one project, we can make this good. And they ship something that's actually decent. And that's what we call spot UX design. And it's because throughout the organization, there are little spots of folks who, who do this. And suddenly, the design uh, uh, start to appear. But it never really catches on. A release goes out, people go, oh, that's really cool. We should do more of that. And then they go back to doing what they've always done, and uh, nothing really changes in the organization. And eventually, that person quits and goes someplace where they're appreciated. Just saying. <laughs> but there's an inflection point that does happen in organizations. And that inflection point happens when some executive realizes that, you know this UX thing? This is important to us. 
we need to start making some investment here. We need to start doing this. Why don't we get us some of them designer types and put them in the, in the designer cave? And then uh, uh, we, we'll get a manager and, and make them the design manager. And, or maybe we could just promote one of the designers that they know what they do. And, uh, uh, and suddenly, we have what we call UX design as a service. This is basically an internal agency that is doing the design work, and it is serving the rest of the organization, going from team to team to team, trying to deliver as much user experience design as they can, initially spending all their time just convincing people to, to hire them, and then uh, once they get people to start doing that and the teams start to see value, they're now in this place where they can uh, uh, take it further. And so that's this. And, and for the longest time, we thought this was the, the goal. The goal was to build this team, to get that manager senior enough that they get a seat at the table. There's a table. <laughs> and you're supposed to have a seat at it. It's a Herman Miller chair, I believe. And, and, uh, uh, and the goal is to, is to sit at that table and, and, you know, butterflies emerge. I don't know. <laughs> and so the, the, uh, that was what we thought the goal was. But it turns out there's another inflection point, and it's a sort of strange inflection point. It happens when one of the teams that you're working with gets really pissed off at that central service because they can't get enough of the designers. Turns out that the design as a service is always running like an agency, and as a result, they're always switching people in and out, and, and they have to work with multiple teams at once because they never have enough people to do the whole job. And so the problem that they have is, is that the team, which is suddenly realizing that design is really valuable, is finding that the designer's not there too much of the time, or they have someone new they have to bring in and train up, and they're losing all this valuable effort. So someone says, you know what? We need to get us our own designer. Let's make that happen. And they go off and they do that. And that stage is what we call embedded UX design. And then embedded UX design is when these teams demand that they have their own designer and they go off and hire one. And now they've got their own designer who reports to the team's management, not the, head of, not the design management, and they are thinking about multiple releases and have coherency and cohesion across different things, and, and they're really right there working on the problem 24-7. And for the longest time, we thought this was the best we could do. I mean, if we could get a designer in every team in the organization, how cool would that be? So we thought this was our, our peak. This would be it. And then we started to notice that there was another inflection point. And that inflection point came when people who were not the designer, product manager, developer, they started to make design decisions. Well, actually, they'd been making design decisions all along. But their design decisions actually started to produce good results. Right? Up until this point, they would make a design decision, and the designer would go, no, 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 let me redo that for you. Right? But now they're producing stuff that's like, hey, that, that's pretty good. Keep do, do more of that. And suddenly, suddenly, we are now in the next stage, which we call infused UX design. And infused UX design is when... Uh, Non-designers on the team are making good, smart design decisions themselves. They have become fluent in their own design skills. And when this happens, suddenly the designers on the team can start working on the harder problems. And things get better. The products that are delivered are better products. So if we look at this, we can definitely say that in 1997, parks and resorts was definitely in the dark ages. They really had no clue. They just wanted to get a system that allowed reservations to happen to show up on the screen. That was everything. 
The fact that nine out of 10 people ended up calling the 800 number, that didn't matter to them. In fact, they were paying the 800 number, the toll-free number people uh, uh, commission. So as far as they were concerned, it was a win-win for everybody. And that was how they were thinking about it. But in 2014, in order to produce the Magic Man, they had to be infused UX design. Everybody had to understand design. The people who were label, lay, laying the cables in the parks, the people who were putting in the point of sale systems, the people who were in charge of creating the system that controlled who got access to what hotel room, all of those people had to understand what this project was and how it worked and what great design was. That's the only way they could ship it. So this is a 17 year process. If you're looking at this chart and you're putting yourself somewhere here, you're saying, I think our organization is here and you've been at this for less than 17 years, you're ahead of Disney. <laughs> Good work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep it up. Keep pushing. That's good. Now, here's the thing. I say that Disney is at infused UX design. I say that in 1997, they were in the dark ages. But that's actually not an accurate way to talk about this. And the reason is, is that an organization can't be at a place in this, in this maturity model. And that's because organizations are, in essence, made up of teams. And each team occupies its own place in the maturity model. So when we think of teams across an organization, some of them are going to get it. Some of them are going to understand what good design is. And other ones, they're going to still be in the dark ages. And so we have to tackle this on a team-by-team -team basis. But it actually is a little harder than that, because in order to determine where a team is, we had to figure out how to measure that. And what we realized was that the way to do that was to deal with another fact, which is that teams, well, they're made of people. It's like Soylent Green. They're made of people. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but your teams are made of people. And not just any people. They're made of influencers, worst kind of people. <laughs> people who want to have a say in everything, right? So it's not just the designers on the team that we have to measure. We have to measure what the developers and the product managers know because they influence the design, the experience that the user has. We have to measure what the uh, uh, people in compliance and regulatory know, or the general managers know, because they're making policies that affect the user's experience. We have to, we have to measure what the executives know, because you know when the executives come in and they do what we call, the technical name is the seagull maneuver. The seagull maneuver is when they swoop into your project, poop all over your ideas, and swoop out. <laughs> also known as the executive poop and swoop. <laughs> When the executives do that poop and swoop thing, they're making design decisions that affect the user experience. And if they don't understand design and how it's done, they will slow you down. And so that's the thing. We, we would love to be able to say, okay, the best, you know, give the team a better designer and their maturity will go up. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. Right? It turns out that it's not even the average of the team's understanding of design. It's the understanding of the least mature person, the most immature person on the team. That is the uh, person we have to look at. And you've all been in this situation where you understand design, other folks around you understand design, and then that product manager or developer who has a lot of influence says, I don't understand. And you end up having to spend so much time trying to convince them, and most of the time you don't, and you end up shipping something that's less than desirable. And it makes sense, right? If I'm a product manager and I'm faced with figuring out 
whether I choose this option or that option. And this option is poorly designed, but it's going to ship faster. And that option is better designed, but it's going to ship slower. And I can't tell the difference in design. All I'm seeing is ship slower, ship, ship faster. Of course I'm going to pick ship faster. Who wouldn't? That's what they will do. It's until they are literate in good and bad design that they will ever be able to see that design makes a difference. They're unconsciously incompetent, and that's hurting our work. So it turns out that our job as design leaders becomes to get people to level up, to get the entire team up, particularly that least mature influencer. If we can get them to be fluent, we can do many, many more things. In 1953, Honeywell introduced a product that changed the way we thought about consumer products. And interestingly enough, it was a thermostat. The H model thermostat, to be specific. You guys have thermostats here, right? Okay, just check it. I was in Iceland, I showed this picture, they're like, I don't know what that is. We live on volcanoes. They heat our house. <laughs> we want to change the temperature, we open a window. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Honeywell delivered this product. This product was designed by a guy named Henry Dreyfus. Honeywell had hired Henry and his team in, and they did all the designery things. They, they created prototypes, and they did user research, and they studied what made uh, work, and they created you know, hundreds of different working models of this thing. They tested them with, with different people, and they came up with this thing. And this thing took over the world. This was, this was the thermostat that everybody had in their house for decades. And it was the market leader in thermostats. It raised them billions and billions of dollars of revenue. And it's simple. You just turn the dial to make it warmer, turn the dial the other way to make it cooler. It solved all the problems. That was it. And it remained sort of the king of thermostats until 2011 when the Nest came out. I don't know if you know this, but there's actually, I had to prepare for this talk here in Amsterdam, and there's actually an EU regulation now that says that if you give a talk on design, you are supposed to mention the nest. <laughs> I, unlike the other speakers, am in compliance. <laughs> Check. <laughs> now, I don't actually really want to talk about the nest that much because it's, it's not that interesting. In fact, I... I Personally, I don't like the device. It's not always that reliable. To me, it's sort of like having the eye of Sauron in your house. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's creepy, but it's cool. But here's the thing. The thing that interests me about the nest is not the nest. It's actually Honeywell. Why didn't Honeywell come up with the nest? They were absolutely the market leader. How come they did not do that? And to talk about that, we have, to, we have one more maturity model we have to sort of talk about here, and that's the maturity model of markets. It's actually independent from companies and individuals. And in the maturity market of, of, of markets, we start with technology. Technology uh, is the, you know, whenever a new product comes out, it's, just that it can do the thing is cool, right? This is the Motorola StarTac. This thing cost uh, uh, about, uh, what, uh, 3,000 euros, and it weighed four kilos, and you had to shout in it to make it work. Uh, but it worked. It, it did what it was supposed to do. And it was the only one of its kind. And so, you know, if you wanted to, to talk on this thing, you had to buy two. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then, you know, give the other one to the person you want to talk to, you know, run over, give it to them, then run across the room and say, I'm calling you. And 
that's how, you, that's how this thing worked, and this was the thing. But then eventually Motorola had competitors, and suddenly competitors now drive us to a new stage, which is we're focused on features. And in this war of features, it's always about who has the most features, who has the least features, right? You can always tell you're in this stage because whenever they market the product, they have this chart, this, this little chart in your thing, and uh, across the top are the different products. You and your competitor down the side are all the features, and under yours it says yes, 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 and under theirs it says no, 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 sometimes no, 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 no. And that, that's, you know, the, the war of features. And that, but what happens is eventually there are, there, the products come out, there are features nobody cares about, right? It's just, just like, I don't care about this anymore. This is how Microsoft gave us the paperclip. And suddenly there are, are just features that nobody cares about. At that point, it becomes about the experience. Give me something that actually does the job, right? Just about the time that the iPhone came out, people were complaining all the time, I just want a phone that makes phone calls. I don't need all these things. And when the first version of the iPhone came out, it was actually really sort of dampened down in terms of the features it had, right? Remember, you couldn't use video. There was no video capability. You couldn't use 4G. It was, it was 3G uh, 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 or less, or Edge, I think, at the time. And... Uh, um, and you couldn't, uh, 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 you couldn't send pictures and SMS messages. I mean, it could, there were so many things it couldn't do that today's products do. But it did what it did very well. It was a great experience, and as a result, it sold quite well. And that's how the, this process works. We go technology, features, experience. Now, there's, there's a bigger thing, which is when suddenly the thing that you buy the product for actually gets subsumed by a bigger experience, right? And that's happened with the iPhone. Nobody buys the iPhone to make calls anymore. In fact, there's an entire generation of people that we have bred on this planet who hate making phone calls on the phone. They hate talking on the phone, and yet they all have phones, mm -hmm. right? And instead, uh, uh, it's this bigger thing. And at that stage, we get into the commodity stage. And this stage is, is so crazy. And what it is, is that, is that, you know, you don't even realize what's a piece of something else. So for example, American Airlines was just in this big lawsuit with a company you may know of called GoGo -Go In Flight. They make the Wi-Fi on American Airlines planes. And American was uh, suing them because they had signed this 10-year contract, and halfway through it, GoGo -Go Wi-Fi was, was so bad that Americans' customers were saying, you know, we're booking on other flights because the Wi-Fi on this thing is too bad. And so they were, they were actually transferring to other airlines to, to be able to do their work on the plane. And so American took them to court. The judge laughed them out of court saying, who the hell signs a 10-year contract for Wi-Fi? And... Threw the thing out of court. GoGo -Go and American have made up. GoGo is now installing better hardware. But the fact is, is, is that who thought Wi-Fi was the most important part of a plane? Right? Well, for American, this was the case. So these are the stages. And if we want to think in terms of experience and commodity, we have to take into account that the only way organizations can get there is they have to be infused UX design. So if our goal is to own that market and really be the ones who change what's going on, we have to get our teams to being infused UX design. That's the business case. But I still haven't answered the question. I still haven't answered the question. How come Honeywell was the wasn't the first it to invent the Nest? I mean, they should have been. If we look at the, their progress, we can see it, right? They came out with the H model, and then they produced a bunch of products that had features like programmable uh, 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 thermostats, but these never took off. They were hard to use. No one could figure them out. They were very complicated. And they thought, well, there's no market in programmable things for the home. People won't buy it. And then the Nest comes out. And they just completely missed the market. They just, they just didn't see it coming. But there's another reason that's actually much bigger. If we look at the other maturity model, which is the organizational one, 
The H model was definitively spot UX design. Henry Dreyfus, when they hired him, was the only designer at Honeywell. Nobody else understood design. When he left, nobody at Honeywell knew design. He took his team with him. And then Henry Dreyfus did what all great designers eventually do. He died. <laughs> no, seriously, if you become a great designer, you will die too. <laughs> Trust me, it happens. I've been in this business since you were before you were born. I know. We've established this. Page up, page down, insert, delete. Um, the Nest, on the other hand, the Nest team started at Infused UX Design. That's where they began. They had a design, UX design culture built in from the very beginning. So they had an advantage that Honeywell did not have. Now, there are those who will argue that Honeywell didn't care, that Honeywell is a big business, that thermostats were actually a very small part of the very large business. I mean, they sell industrial equipment and all sorts of different types of machinery. This is just peanuts in their revenue stream. Peanuts, peanuts. And how much is a peanut worth? Well, Google paid $3.2 billion for peanuts. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Nest's investors would think twice about peanuts at that price tag, or uh, Honeywell's investors. But here's the deal. We couldn't figure out at first how Nest pulled this off. Because we had been under the belief that you had to go through all the stages. Every other company we'd ever studied went through all the stages. How was it that Nest was able to just start at being design infused. And we thought, well, maybe it's because they're a startup. And our first theory was this theory that, that uh, startups just can sort of pick where they are. We, we called it the, the stem cell theory. Embryonic stem cells, when they first start, the, 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 uh, 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 their job is to just reproduce, right? So their job as a cell is to only make other cells. And they make as many as they can really fast. But then, it, but then they don't die off. This is the crazy thing about stem cells. They, in other cases, when a cell is done doing its job, it dies. But uh, stem cells don't die. They actually become a different cell. In the human body, stem cells will sometimes uh, uh, become liver cells. Some of them will become colon cells. Some will become stomach cells. And so they actually change purpose. And we thought, well, maybe... That's what happens with startups. Maybe when startups are really small, really, really small, they can do anything. And then they reach some certain size and they start to change and they have to pick one of these things and Nest just happened to pick infused UX design. And we thought this theory, the stem cell theory actually worked because we had lots of evidence in the organizations we were dealing with that startups often act like colons. <laughs> But it turns out it was much simpler than that. It wasn't this convoluted transitioning mutation thing. It turns out it was actually very simple. The reason Nest was able to uh, pull this off was that they, uh, uh, they were able, uh, uh, through their owner, the guy who founded them was Tony Fidel. Tony Fidel was the designer at Apple who created the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. And Tony Fidel, when he started Nest, did what startup founders often do. He poached his old team from Apple. So he got the people who knew how to design this stuff, who he had trained, who they had all trained together. They all became design and fused together as a team. And then as they hired more people, they were able to get more folks. And as a result, they, uh, they were very conscious and they would only hire people who understood design. Even if you just wanted a job in accounting, you had to understand design because that's how they thought. And so they made sure that everybody in the organization was at least fluent in design. 
Honeywell, on the other case, was a big company with thousands of employees, most of whom knew nothing about design. And as a result, they were not design-infused. So Honeywell faced a challenge, right? They could either fire everybody and hire only people who are design-infused, or they could train everybody. That was their choice, really. And that's what caused them to happen. Okay, one more thing on this maturity. One more inflection point. Turns out there's an inflection point that what happens when a uh, uh, organization gets to being pretty mature, they still have to deal with one problem. See, before this point, a product is good enough to ship as long as it works technically and it meets the business needs. If the design isn't ideal, that's okay. We'll fix it in the next release. And that's all we say, right? Oh, we'll fix that in the next release. For the longest time, I thought Microsoft's tagline was, we'll fix that in the next release. <laughs> but some companies get past this. And that inflection point is what we call the UX tipping point. And what happens after that is that suddenly, the company will only ship the product if it works technically, meets the business needs, and is delightfully designed. This is the UX tipping point. The Disney Magic Band was two years late. Two years earlier, it was partially working. You could use it to unlock hotel room doors. It had other minor functionality that worked. But they didn't ship it. They kept it. And this billion dollar project, the most expensive project that Disney had ever had, let alone anybody else, uh, was under incredible scrutiny by the board members, by the chairman of the board, Michael Eisner, all of these folks. The product managers were getting calls every day from Michael Eisner saying, is it done yet? And they'd say, no, it's not ready yet. He'd say, okay, keep doing what you're doing. I'll call you tomorrow. And... <laughs> Uh, uh, and that was it. That was the tipping point, right? They had gotten to that point. And that's where we have to get to. That's what we're shooting for. So quickly, just some ways we can do that. Dan Mall, who Brad had mentioned earlier, uh, uh, gave me this idea of, of this notion of a design process. Right? Dan says the design process, we think of like a Newton's pendulum. We pick it up and we let it go, and it's supposed to just uh, keep going, just supposed to take off. And we fixate on process. We talk about process. We show our process. We ask interview candidates, what's your process? As if we're going to let them use it. We're not even going to let them use our process because this does not work. Design processes don't work because they can't possibly operate the same every time because there are too many conditions that happen. This is a sports ball pitch. And when the sports ball team comes running onto the football rink or the basketball field, uh, uh, they don't come with a Gantt chart that lays out exactly which player will do what at what point. Harold, I'd like you to score at exactly four minutes and 42 seconds into the second quarter, because that's when you scored in the last game, and that worked really well. Could you do that again, please? <laughs> right? Instead, they have to be dynamic. They have to change with the situation on the field. They have to take into account the strengths and weaknesses of their opponent, their own strengths and weaknesses, the conditions of the field, what's happening during the game, the injured list, all of these different things. And as a result, they have to put together this set of understanding of what they're gonna do in every situation and be able to change dynamically. And we call that plays. And it turns out that we can think of plays as this these things we do depending on the situation. And we've identified more than 130 plays that 
teams have used, organizations have used to get more and more mature. And we can actually categorize these plays by where they are in the maturity model. Some plays you do for literacy, some plays you do for fluency. And we can start to look at this. And there's 130 of these things. This is just a small sample of the plays, but there's a tremendous amount of them. So, for example, here's one play. This is uh, uh, we call immersive exposure. And we've talked today a bunch about getting out, meeting your users. This is taking this to an extreme, right? This is making sure that everybody gets a chance to meet users. And the thing about this particular play is that it changes the way teams work in a dramatic way. What happens is, is that they start to see the difference between good and bad because they can think that their product is good, but it's, they put it out there and they see the hell that we put our users through and they're like, oh, that's not good, and they have to fix it. Usability tests, which we've talked about, is a good start. That's a great place to begin. But what's even better is getting out into the field, meeting those customers, seeing what's going on. And what we've noticed is, is that if we can uh, uh, get each influencer out for at least two hours every six weeks to meet with somebody, it doesn't have to be two hours of one person, it can be 15 minute, eight, you know, eight sessions of 15 minutes across the six weeks. If we can do that, suddenly we are able to produce fantastic results and you see a dramatic change in the quality. So if that's all you do, you get this huge change. And you can do things like sort of just keep simple track of what's going on. We can take a, 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 you know, a story, as we've talked about, right? This idea that we take the series of events that happens to the user, and we can put it on a scale of frustration to delight, and then we can map that saying, okay, that part was delightful, but the next part was frustrating, and from there and there and there and there. That's one. So that's immersive exposure. Another one is shared experience vision. This one helps us see beyond just what's happening today into the future. And this teaches us both literacy and fluency. And what this is, you can think of this as answering the question, five years from now, what will the experience be like? We not just found out what the experience is like today, what do we want the experience to be like five years from now? And we can think of this as basically a flag in the sand that everybody can see, but it's gonna take us five years to get there, and we just take baby steps the whole way. How do we figure out what that flag should be? Well, we go back to our journey map, and we ask the question, what if we made it delightful all the way across? If we made it delightful all the way across, what would that story be? What would that be like? How would that be different from today? That becomes our vision. And then the last one I want to tell you about is this idea of a culture of continuous learning. In a culture of continuous learning, what we're doing is we're building all the way to mastery because we're always learning. We're always thinking about learning, and we're admitting that we're learning. Now, we fetishize failure. We're always talking about you have to learn from failure, you have to fail a lot, you have to uh, uh, have lots of failures to learn anything, can't learn anything if you don't fail, you know, move fast, break things. I don't believe any of this. This is awful, right? Nobody wants to be called into the CEO's office and be asked, why did we fail? Right? Well, sir, we thought that it's the only way we could learn, so we planned to fail in this project. And because we know that you needed to learn, we decided to make it obvious, so we made it really big. <laughs> no, no. The question we want to answer is, what did we learn? Right? We shouldn't fetishize failure. We should fetishize learning. Tr trust me on this, right? I know lots of people who seem to continually fail and they never seem to learn a thing. <laughs> and really, the best people to have in your life are the people who learn things every day and they do it without having to fail all the time, right? So that's what we want. And we do this in simple ways, right? Many of you do stand-ups. Uh, we do this at our place with our students at the school. We have the, say, the sort of standard questions. What'd you do since the last stand-up? What are you gonna do for the next stand-up? What's your biggest blockers? But then what we do is we uh, ask a question, right? We ask, what is the most important thing you've learned and how will it change what you do in the future? 
And it turns out that that question changes everything. Because every day you have to sit back and think about, well, what did I learn yesterday? What will it change that I do? And when everybody in the organization, product managers, CEOs, all these people are standing up and saying, well, yesterday I learned this and it will change in the future. This is something I didn't know two days ago. I learned it yesterday. It creates a culture. Culture doesn't change in big ways. Culture changes in tiny little ways all the time. And if we're going to change our culture to truly make it a learning culture, we have to have lots of reflection, lots of time to sit back and think, what was it we just learned? So these are it. This is, this is it. These are the three biggest plays out of the 130. If you just did three, these three things, you would see remarkable improvement in your organization. There are 127 more, but but these three are a good start. And if you did this, you too could create a product that is so cool that a six-year-old could walk up to what's called the magic Mickey, hold up her wristband to it. It makes this little whirring sound that's really sort of cute. And then within moments, all of the employees, they call them cast members, all the cast members for Disney, they're standing within about a two and a half, three meter radius of that magic Mickey, turn around, look at the kid and say, Happy birthday, Angela. Okay, it's a little creepy. <laughs> but it's cool. <laughs> that's what we're after. And that's what I came to talk to you about. So just to, to recap here, we've got to get our teams from unconscious incompetence at least up to conscious competence. And we have to do that by moving our organization all the way through from UX as a service to embedded UX design to finally infused UX design. And to do that, we're gonna need a playbook, something filled with plays that are specific to our teams, specific to our organization, that is going to help them get there. Now, just wanna tell you about this. Turns out that we run workshops to help teams build their playbooks you don't have to do it this way, but if you want our help to do it, you can come. We do them in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is a lovely, lovely part of the world, and we do it in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> which is also a lovely part of the world. And uh, in, this, in this workshop, uh, we, we help folks build uh, their own playbooks. So if you're interested in that, check out the website. It's playbook.uie.com. And finally, if you're interested in this topic, I write a lot on this topic. In fact, in the next few weeks, we're launching a new newsletter just on strategy. And so if you are interested in this, you will love the newsletter, articles about all the things I talked about here and more. Uh, so you can sign up for that at UIE.com. You can uh, uh, find me. If, we, if, uh, if we're not connected on, on LinkedIn, please, by all means, connect to me on LinkedIn. It's a great way for me to talk to you. Say hi. I'll say hi back. Tell me what your big challenges are. We can talk about it. I'm, I'm really interested. And then finally, you can follow me on the Twitters where I tweet about design, design experience, design education, and the amazing customer service habits of the airline industry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. <laughs>